The Assyriology channel is dedicated to the study of ancient Mesopotamia and the ancient Near East. Hello everyone and welcome to the first Assyriology channel live chat. I created this channel about a month and a half ago, almost two months ago now, and the channel has not been as high output or as productive as I was hoping it would be at its inception. Um, it's been about two and a half weeks, maybe even three weeks since I've released a video um, and I've been really, uh, really taken back or just surprised at uh, how time consuming the whole process is. Uh, writing out content, recording it, editing the content, and uploading it. Um, I was hoping to be able to release a video a week. Um, obviously, I have failed to do so. And I'm hoping by switching over to more of a live chat format, I can reduce the amount of time I spend writing out a script and editing the videos. Um, this chat is just going to be me sort of speaking freely. I don't, I don't have any notes or really much prepared. I do have a theme for today's chat. We're going to talk about food and food production in ancient Mesopotamia. Um, hopefully future live chats, I'll be able to get guests to come on the program. Um, I don't really have a good community here locally in Florida for interviewing guests here in town. Um, hopefully I'll be able to maybe do some interviews or something like that via online programs. Um, if you're interested in, in coming on the Assyriology program, if you're an Assyriologist, maybe an Assyriology student, or even just a long-term enthusiast who loves to talk about the topic, um, please send me a message or even just say something in the comments section or contact me in some way. Um, that being said, moving on to agriculture and food in ancient Mesopotamia. So the ancient Mesopotamians used a three-tier agricultural system. Um, this was a system of parent cropping that allowed them to create a, um, an ecosystem that would allow the plants to protect each other and to thrive. Um, this, this incorporated a variety of methods and techniques, but, but the three-story three system is what it's named after. And that's the a top tier of tall date palms, which uh, require a lot of sun, and those protect the less sun tolerant plants down below. The second tier is your shorter fruit bearing trees, and perhaps some nut bearing trees in there as well. Um, and then down on the ground, we're going to find all of our ground crops. Uh, mainly, most of the land is going to be dedicated or was dedicated towards grain. Um, and then we're also going to see some, some legumes, some, some pulses, some, some other things, uh, small vegetable gardens, your, your herbs and spices, things like that. Um, let's see, uh, starting with the top tier, the, the date palms, uh, I believe the Sumerian term for the date palm was Geshemar, if I'm recalling correctly off the top of my head. Um, dates were the major fruit of the region. They were eaten both fresh as well as dried. Uh, dates are mainly sugar, as you may be if you're up on nutritional contents. Um, sh sugar carbs, it, it was a great way to get carbohydrates. Um, it's also a great way to get vitamin C um, and a, a variety of other nutrients in, in small numbers. Um, but that was, that was your main fruit in ancient Mesopotamia. And even up into modern times, a uh, breakfast of seven dates was kind of a classic breakfast to eat in the region as you wake up and eat seven dates. Um, it's something I myself do at times. I like to try to replicate Mesopotamian meals in my kitchen and a great way to start your day is waking up and eating some dates. Um, moving down to the second tier, we find apples, pomegranates. Uh, if I recall correctly, the Sumerian term for an apple tree was Gesh Hashur. Um, you'll know each of these trees, the tree is going to start off with gesh to, to designate it being a tree, and then you'll find the term for the fruit as the second. So for instance, um, the Sumerian term for an apple was hashur. Uh, the Sumerian term for an apple tree would be gesh hashur. Um, same thing with uh, pomegranates. Uh, Sumerian term for pomegranate 
uh, nirma, Sumerian term for a pomegranate tree, Gesh nirma. Um, we're also going to find uh, nut bearing trees. Uh, there's uh, Geshlam, Geshlam tur, Geshlam gal. Uh, that would be a nut tree, small nut tree, large nut tree, respectively. Um, these would be almonds, walnuts, and pistachios. Um, there, I haven't come across a lot of good papers that have uh, delved into which nuts were which, um, so I can't really speak with too much expertise on that topic. Um, I can say a bit more about fruit trees. Uh, there's a number of, number of great papers on uh, the growing of fruit in ancient Mesopotamia. Um, so that's, that's your third and your second tier. Then your ground, your ground crops are going to be the majority of the staple foods in ancient Mesopotamia. Um, in Earth Three texts, which really do a wonderful job at documenting out the food production process, um, barley always consisted of 90 something percent of the food that was documented. Um, as I recall, during Shulgi 47, Barley was 98% of the food that was accounted in Shulgi 47, if I recall correctly. Um, so for the most part, people were, were eating and as well as trading a lot of barley. Um, the other grain that was grown was wheat, although not in as high ratio. Um, the Sumerian term for barley was she. It's very, very she. Um, was, it was a very... Uh, Highly attested term. Um, the Sumerian terms for gig or terms for wheat. There were there were several different varieties of wheat. Uh, gig being the most common of them. Um, only one point seven percent during that year I had mentioned earlier. Uh, Shulki forty seven. It's it's a year that um, oats and pots and macawa and all of the various scholars that have have written wonderful papers on agricultural productivity during their three period really delve into is shulgi 47 and then shulgi 47 only 1.7 percent of the fields were dedicated towards gig so that really that shows to us just how popular barley was in contrast to wheat um that's believed largely to be because of barley being so salinity tolerant. Uh, you can grow barley in, in soil that, that has very, very high salt levels. And um, salinization was always a big problem in Mesopotamia. Um, barley farming, not only can it, it can tolerate uh, high levels of salt in the soil, barley farming also increases the levels of salt in the soil. So, which has a steamrolling effect of, or snowballing effect of making it worse and worse over time. Now, going back to the, the agricultural system, the complete ecosystem that the farmers would make, or at least attempt to make, um, onions would be grown interchangeably in the fields along in between the years of barley, um, growing onions, uh, the, the alaceous vegetable fields would decrease salt levels. So they would establish a system where you would grow grain for a certain number of years, you would let the fields go fallow for a certain amount of time, and then you would grow it, you would grow alaceous vegetables, you would grow onions to repair the soil, to decrease the salt, and then you could grow back to being able to grow grain. Now, those rotation systems of how long you would lay the fields go fallow, that changed over time. Um, typically, well, I don't wanna say typically, um, in the text that I'm familiar with, we see two years active, one year fallow. Um, a more desirable ratio would be a more even ratio of one year active, one year fallow, or two years active, two years fallow. But um, that, did, that changed over time, also changed over where the area was. Different regions would, would have problems with salt over other ones, how, you know, where you were in relation to which river, things like that. Um, some of the other crops that were grown down on the on the ground floor include included legumes, um, particularly after the Mesopotamians uh, made contact with the Indus Valley region. Um, lentils become very popular. Um, in later periods, uh, sesame seed became very very popular to grow, but not to eat 
the seed, but to produce oil. Um, the Maluans, well, actually prior to the Maluan period, sesame seed was imported from the Indus River Valley into Mesopotamia. But by the year three period, when Mesopotamians were, were trading very, very heavily with the Maluans, um, sesame seed had sesame seed oil had become by far the most dominant cooking oil and just oil to use in the region as a whole. Uh, prior to that, during the early dynastic period, we see pig fat was used a lot. Um, they still use pig fat in the early three period and the later periods too. Just you know, the sesame sesame seed oil was you would say a lot less expensive, even though. It, Using the term expensive, actually, I think is misnomer. I, I don't think expensive is the correct term to use, but uh, it, uh, sesame seeds oil was not so as expensive at the marketplace when you're trading for it as uh, as pig fat was. Um, so that covers, let's see, we got barley and wheat for our grains, mainly barley. Um, let's talk about vegetables. Um, the Sumerian term, uh, most vegetables, well, I don't most, a lot of vegetables were labeled with the determinative SAR. Um, a determinative, and I'll, I'll be just mentioning this over and over because I'm always talking about determinative. Um, just as a quick aside, over at Kianger, which is my, my Facebook blog, which was the inspiration to make a YouTube channel. Um, all of the posts there are organized by the determinative. I mainly write determinative oriented posts. So a lot of my content here, just by what I know about, I'll end up talking about things based off of how, what determinative they're organized by. Um, so painting back to vegetables, uh, the determinative vegetable, uh, uh, the determinative for vegetables was SAR. A lot of them are labeled with that, uh, but determinative is a silent, um, term that is added before or after, sometimes in the middle, of uh, terms that uh, would designate to the reader what type of word it is. It's a, it's a silent term, though. You don't say SAR every time you see it. Um, the most abundant group of vegetables and texts that I'm aware of are alaceous vegetables. Um, these vegetables would usually be written with the sign SHUM2 in some varying combination. Um, when shum tu was written on its own, it was a term for garlic. When combined with sickle, shum sickle was a term for onions. Um, zahadin was another really common vegetable. Um, some sickle, some and, and zahadin were typically mentioned together in like a trinity. Um, we don't exactly know what zahadin was. I personally lean towards that it was some kind of leek. Um, it's believed to be some alacious vegetable, either some type of onion or leek. Um, but some, some sickle and zahadin were often tied together on a string to be used together for, for culinary purposes. And they were also grown together and planted together at the same time in fields. Um, onions and garlic are still grown together <laughs> In garden, vegetable gardens to this day. Um, now, when you plant them together, garlic, of course, matures significantly slower. Um, onion, you'll typically get to harvest that about three, four months after you plant it, versus garlic's gonna take gonna take more like five months to grow. Um, but if you plant them together first, you yield the the onions and yield the uh, the garlic a little bit later, and that kind of like. It, it, it works well as far as labor. Um, Alasis vegetables were planted all throughout the cool months in ancient Mesopotamia. Um, typically, uh, plant times, would they, would they would try to plant in between September to December with a target harvest time for onions sometimes around March or April and garlic slightly thereafter, just like I described. Other vegetables that were commonly attested would include turnips. The Sumerian term for the turnip was lubisar. Um, so turnips were an important source for vitamin C for the people of ancient Mesopotamia. Um, lettuce was attested. The, the term hisar was a Sumerian term for lettuce. Um, beets 
uh, both the beet greens as well as beet roots were were tested and were consumed in ancient Mesopotamia. Um, there was uh, cucumbers were a commonly attested vegetable. Uh, there was uh, herbs and spices. Uh, the the pairing of cumin and coriander that uh, many of us Westerners associate with Indian food um, we find in ancient Mesopotamia. Uh, coriander being a a very prolific spice in the period. Um, other spices that were attested either texturally or archaeologically include a uh, licorice root, juniper, um, mint. Uh, the, the term mungazi was a Sumerian term for, for spices. Um, it's debated about what the term gazi meant on its own. Um, some scholars have debated it was a term for mint. Um, other scholars have debated it was a term for licorice root. Um, either way, both licorice root and mint were known to the people of ancient Mesopotamia. Um, none of these spices were attested in the abundance that uh, cumin and coriander were, though. Those were the most commonly attested of, of the spices. Um, it's occurring to me at this point in the live chat that um, the live chat's kind of a uh, kind of kind of just turned into me ranting off about various Sumerian terms for the, uh, the food products that they had available. So I'll try to, to after I'm finished recording this live chat, I'll try to throw together a, a chart as a visual aid of of all the terms that I'm kind of just throwing at you as as I'm going. Hopefully that'll help. So let's do a real quick recap of, of what we've discussed. We've, we've covered grains with the staple grain being barley and that consisting the, the bulk of the food that was consumed. And, and then to a lesser extent, there was also wheat. Then we also covered fruits with the, the staple fruit being dates. And then we also have apples and pomegranates or some other ones we didn't discuss like pears. Um, then we've also discussed our vegetables. Um, we had alacious vegetables, which to me and most modern Westerners, we, we kind of think of those as more of as something we add for to flavor other foods, things like, like garlic or, or even things like onions and leeks and shallots and chives. Those are, those are things I would add to other foods rather than being you know, something I sit down and, and eat of it as a meal, but, but they most certainly could be staple foods. Um, then we also find other vegetables like uh, we, we talked about turnips, we talked about lettuce, there are other greens, um, beets, uh, both beet root as well as the beet greens, those, those were grown and consumed in ancient Mesopotamia. Um, then we discussed some of the legumes that were brought over from the Indus River Valley region. We, we, we talked about lentils, uh, broad beans. Um, we also briefly mentioned nuts, uh, wild, walnuts, almonds, pistachios, th those were all, all known in ancient Mesopotamia. Let's talk a little bit about meat and animal products. Um, most of the meat, cons first off, the typical person in ancient Mesopotamia would have consumed very little meat. Uh, meat was probably likely consumed at festivals and at group occasions. Now, mind you, festivals were fairly common. The, the first and 15th and 30th of every month was a festival day. So, so that eating communally probably was fairly common, but when you were not eating communally, you probably didn't consume all that much meat. Um, most of the meat probably did not come from domestic animals. Um, the domestic animals they did consume there were there were there was sheep there was goats um venison meat was attested in um the famous yale culinary tablets um but most of the meat being consumed when it was consumed probably was not from domestic animals um animals meat that was hunted that was attested would include gazelle uh, venison was attested um, but probably more common than meat from hunting would be meat from fowling and fishing. Um, 
duck and a, a, a wide variety of different birds. Uh, fowling was more common than hunting, at least that's my understanding and that's what I've always read. Um, and then fishing, of course, more common than either. Um, in fact, still to this day, fishing is very common in the Tigris Mesopotamia region. Um, catfish and carp that most of us today probably would not find very appetizing where the main fish people were consuming. Um, I love catfish, don't get me wrong. I didn't, I'm didn't. i not lumping catfish in with carp on that. Uh, give me a good river catfish any day of the week. Um, carp on the other hand, yeah, I've never eaten carp. I doubt I ever will. It doesn't smell so great. And carp has lateral bones, which makes it very, very difficult to clean. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with cleaning fish. Uh, normally when you flay a fish, you're running along the length of a fish, which with a carp, due to the bones, that isn't possible. Uh, that's why typically when carp was consumed, it would be consumed in some form of like a soup or a liquid dish to where you could kind of just, just cook the meat off the bone. Um, it's not really something you can do a fillet of. Um, so yeah, catfish and carp were and are the major fish that um, come out of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Um, a number of fish are attested in cuneiform texts. Unfortunately, most of these terms are, aren't really something that we can uh, put our fingers on which species of fish these apply to. Um, there's dozens and dozens of uh, Sumerian terms for fish. Uh, they're often, they often include the cuneiform, the determinative Q6. Um, some of them we can identify as specific types of catfish and carp. Um, I'll make later videos specifically focusing on fish that, that will go into that. Um, there's, I, I could talk at length all day about, you know, the debates about what the meaning of different fish terms are. There, there's not that many species of fish that swim in the Tigris and Euphrates to this day, or uh, that we have archaeological, uh, zooarchaeological zoo evidence of ever swimming in the Tigris and Euphrates. So we can kind of narrow it down. And some of the texts describe some of the fish. Um, for instance, like the, the debate between bird and fish, um, it describes, um, well, it gives us some information about both what type of bird it would be and what type of fish it would be based upon their interactions, um, which, which bird species and fish species interact with each other and where the bird built its nest and where this fish swims and how this fish was described and things like that. Um, again, I'll go into this more in a later video. Um, I just kind of wanted to briefly mention it that we do, we do have some ideas about which species of fish these terms do apply to. Um, moving forward, uh, other animal products would include, they did have dairy products, they did have milk and cheese. Um, very, very few people would have gotten to consume these products. Um, they, milk would have gone rancid almost right away. So and, unless you lived around the animals that were being milked, I was gonna say cows at first because I'm an American and we think of cows when we think of milk, but probably uh, ewe milk from female sheep were, was probably a lot more common than cow milk in ancient Mesopotamia. Um, the people of ancient Mesopotamia did have cows, um, particularly around Nippur, there's a very well-known um, archive of text describing the cattle industry there. Um, but that, you know, that is one region in Mesopotamia cattle were a lot more limited compared to, to sheep and goats. Um, shepherds and goat herders were super duper common. Um, so accordingly, when it comes to dairy products, sheep and goat dairy products would be more prolific than cow dairy products. Um, I question how prolific dairy products were at all. There probably wasn't a ton of dairy products, um, just for practical reasons. So that being said, let's let's move back over to to some of the plant derived uh, foods. Uh, there are some some culinary texts that describe some of the different uh, foods. Uh, 
maybe the most popularized one would be Mursu cakes, which some scholars challenge whether it, we should even really think of that as a cake based upon the modern day description of what a, what a cake is. I've seen um, the SOR uh, did an interesting recreation of, uh, of what Mursu cakes look like. Um, and it, I, it didn't look at all like what I would think of a cake. I mean, it, it was more like a, like a date recipe or something. Um, but it did look pretty delicious. And I, it, I nerd out, I totally nerd out when it comes to recreating historical dishes. Uh, something I really like to do, uh, there's this um, famous Yale culinary text for broths. Um, you can order from Amazon or you can get from anywhere the the world's oldest cuisine. It's a Jean Botero, Botero book um, that has the culinary tablets, or if you just Google Yale culinary tablets, I'm sure it'll show it up. It's uh, like YBC. I, I don't have any notes for this live chat or I can tell you the, uh, the tablet name. I'll, I'll try to include it in the comments when I upload the video. Um, in fact, I, I'll try to just include the whole tablet because I already have it all typed up on the uh, Kiander page. Um, cause it's pretty cool. Um, I've recreated the turnip broth several times, um, on the Ininiru page. Um, Ininiru is something that I'll be talking about often in these live chats There's all the other online tools. I'll be talking about these live chats. Um, Ininiru is a website created by Bill McGrath, the Nasiriologist from up in Canada. Um, what I'm specifically talking about here, though, is the uh, Ininiru message board uh, going back several years, about a decade ago now. Um, there's an awesome walkthrough Bill did of his recreating of the, uh, the beet broth on there. Um, there's also another walkthrough online somewhere, I can't remember where, of um, the gazelle broth, where somebody made, uh, remade the recipe for the gazelle broth. Um, so if you search around online, there's, there's a couple cool Mesopotamian recreation for meals. There's also a ton of really cool, um, recreations for, uh, Mesopotamian beers. Um, all of which are based off of the hymn of Ninkasi. Uh, Ninkasi was the Sumerian goddess of brewers and beer production. Um, the, the hymn is, it, it reads like a work song. And it kind of like walks you through the steps of making beer. Now it's it's as as somebody who's dabbled in in brewing beer, it's missing some some very relevant and important steps that the uh, brewmaster has to kind of just make up. But but it's still really it's cool as hell. Um, and I love that there's so many breweries out there that have done this. There's there's probably been at least a dozen um, recreation attempts at this point. Um, so by all means, if you're not familiar with what I'm talking about already, uh, Google Sumerian beer recreation and, and check that out. Um, also again on, on the Kianger page on Facebook, um, a while back, about a year and a half ago, I put together a post about brewers, um, about Lou Bapper, uh, Lou is the determinative that we would add to a or we, I'm not a Sumerian. Uh, it, Lou is the uh, determinative that was added in cuneiform to designate a term as being a profession. Um, Bapper was a term that was used, it, it was a type of um, date sweetened barley bread that was used in beer production. It was also believed to be, it was probably used as a famine food. When things got rough, they would still have Bapper around because it was, it was super well preserved and not what they would go to eat as their first, first year fruit. Um, so anyways, the name of a brewer in ancient Mesopotamia was Lou Bapper. And I put together a Kianger article on Lou Bapper. And in the comments section of that uh, Kianger article, um, I did a pretty painstaking job at uh, linking every single link I could find about these beer recreations. Um, and I put it together all in like replies to one one uh, comment so you can it, if you're on Facebook you can just go to my post on the Kanger page for Lou Bapper and just take a look at all of the various uh, 
recreation attempts. And also just if you're interested, I'll probably do a, another live chat on um, beer, wine, and the brewing of alcoholic beverages in ancient Mesopotamia, just because I, you could just go on and on about that topic. So that concludes our first live chat here about um, food and agriculture in ancient Mesopotamia. Um, this was kind of abstract and free form. I don't have any notes or information, so I'm sure there's there's a lot of really important information that I'm leaving out. Um, there's there's a lot I didn't go into because I don't have any notes or stats or information like uh, yields, uh, typical expected yields from the period or uh, land requirements, labor requirements, things like that. Um, I can say a few things off the top of my head, I guess. Um, as I recall in Macaulay's 1984 paper that um, was printed in a uh, bulletin in Samaritan Agriculture. Oh, real quick, actually, sorry to be scattered right about this. Um, I should mention bulletin on Samaritan Agriculture um, it's the most relevant and significant um, thing to what, what I'm talking about. Um, back in the 80s, all of the, the major scholars in Assyriology got together and they, they put, put together papers specifically talking about agriculture um, in ancient Mesopotamia. Um, it's, the series is kind of hard to find. Um, I, I did eventually end up tracking down PDFs of it. Um, it, it's often abbreviated just under the acronym BSA, um, but the Bolton on Sumerian agriculture is what I find referenced in all of the, still to this day, modern day papers that are being written on agriculture in ancient Mesopotamia. Um, it's what Potts references, it's what, it's what all my favorite scholars, Steinkeller, all my favorite scholars reference um, the BSA. Um, and in, in particular, Makawa's papers in uh, BSA were uh, very uh, groundbreaking because uh, he, he gave us a lot of numbers and facts and figures and stuff. Um, as I recall, Makawa's um, stat for barley production, which would be our, our most relevant um, numbers because barley was, was the main staple food that most of the land was dedicated to. Um, if I recall correctly, it was 1,388 liters per hectare. Uh, was it per hectare? I, it was per hectare. Uh, 1,388 liters per hectare. And if I recall correctly, I think that same paper um, cited a typical worker requirement of um, a worker could typically work uh, 1.5 hectares per work. Um, you can you can take those numbers and figure out some other stuff. Uh, it, it, I can talk about this stuff at, at length when I have the numbers in front of me. Um, I don't you know I don't want to toss out toss out erroneous information on the internet. Um, that's already a very prolific problem, and I don't want to contribute to it. Um, but that being said, go straight to the horse's mouth. Read those Macawa papers. Those those were awesome. Um, if you can find uh, copies of the BSA, and I, I personally, I don't have a copy of BSA 2. So if you find a copy of BSA 2, send it to me, let me know. Um, <laughs> uh, if you can find those, I highly recommend reading through them. They're super, um, I don't know, if they're, I was going to be like, they're really exciting. Most, I find them exciting. I'm obviously very excited even talking about them. But uh, <laughs> they're very informative anyways. Uh, if you made it to this far in this video, you, you're definitely going to find those to be a real treat. Um, D.T. Potts is uh, one of my favorite scholars when it comes to talking about um, anything to do with uh, material culture in ancient Mesopotamia or in ancient Elam for that matter either. Lately he's, he's kind of turned his focus towards Elamite studies, which is um, not my specialization, but it, it's it's very needed. Um, I'm really excited that he's expanding the field of Elamite studies. Um, Potts did a wonderful job in his, uh, I think 1997, in his book that he came out in the 90s um, called uh, Mesopotamia, the Material Foundations, um, at uh, combining textural history work with archeological work. Um, Typically, most scholars 
um, in, in the present gravitate towards uh, just studying cuneiform and they know about the information that we can um, that we can gain from cuneiform text or they just study the archaeology of ancient Iraq and they know the information that uh, an archaeologist would need to know at a dig at a, at a site um, and those are not the same thing um, and so we really need scholars out there like like DT Potts to kind of to, to tie those two uh, I can't say those two fields because the, the, those two approaches together um, see this getting tongue-tied like this is why it takes me so long to, to record a planned video <laughs> Um, but yeah, that's what, one of the things that makes D.T. Potts, uh, one of my favorite scholars, uh, Pittori Steinkiller from, uh, Harvard also has a ton of, well, he's, he's authoritative when it comes to just ancient Mesopotamia as a whole, um, in particular anything dealing with Earth 3 text. Um, but since the, er, the texts from the Earth 3 period are our best uh, textural sources for information about agriculture in Mesopotamia. He's very authoritative on that topic. Um, he's just one of my favorite scholars as a whole. I highly recommend looking up his papers. Um, so that would that kind of that would conclude things I'd recommend checking out uh, um, off the top of my head. Um, I hope you enjoyed these live chat style videos. Again, I, I already said, give me feedback on them. I think the next one I'm gonna do, I'll try to do just like a broad live chat about um, probably something else to do with material culture. Maybe I'll talk about uh, metals or stones. That would be fun to do like a live live chat about metallurgy or stoneworking in ancient Mesopotamia. Um, and let me know in the comment section if uh, you if you have a topic you'd like me to hear about. Um, hopefully I can find some scholars that want to come on and do some interviews. That would be really fun. Um, until next time. Thank you for watching the Assyriology channel. If you've enjoyed this video, please hit the like button. If you didn't, please let us know why in the comments section below. Hit the subscribe button to see more videos on ancient Mesopotamia.